out. Okay. All right, so, so nice to have so many people here. Um, it actually is quite an exciting um, topic. Uh, people, you know, often ask me how I became an organizer and um, it's a long story and everything is a long story, but you don't have five hours. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that I, I tell people is that um, when I tell them that I'm a professional organizer, I usually get one or out of two reactions. Either they get a big smile on their face and they say, oh my gosh, that's amazing. You have to come to my house. Uh, or I get kind of like, look like this going, okay, you are never stepping foot into my house. Um, <laughs> and I laugh and I tell them, I've seen everything. Trust me, everything. I've seen everything. Nothing phases me. And, you know, helping people get organized is really what I love. Um, I think that I probably have undiagnosed um, and I know what it's like when I'm dealing with just too much brain noise, uh, too much clutter. It, it actually slows me down. So I learned a lot of compensatory strategies in order to be able to deal with that. And then I have um, I said 20 years clinical experience working with people with brain injuries and spinal cord injuries. So I spent a lot of time working with occupational therapists, um, just helping my clients figure out how to live their lives in this new way, how to kind of create better environments for them. Um, I've given workshops for seniors with vision issues, kind of help them to figure out how to organize their home in a way that will meet their needs. So really that's what my passion is, is helping people not just to enjoy their space, but to also live in a more functional, practical way so that they just feel more productive. So to go back about the fact that most people say, oh my gosh, you're never coming into my house. I tell them you don't have to worry about it because I actually have a confidentiality clause in my contract, which says what happens in organizing stays in organizing. All right, so um, let's start. I'm gonna share my PowerPoint presentation. Can everybody see that? Oh, hold on one second. I can't hold on. Sorry, a little bit of tech here. I want to be able to see everybody. Give me one second. Share screen. And now I can't see everybody. Share. Let's take a look at that. There we go. That's why I needed my husband over there. All right. So this is the name of my company, In the Clear Organizing Solutions. And really, I kind like I said before get a lot of brain noise when there's too much clutter going around. So I kind of feel that if you clear your space, clear your mind, it just kind of brings everything down. It helps make you grounded. It helps you to function better. Okay, hold on, what if I, it's not going. I'm pressing space. Sorry, I want to get you to the next screen. And it's not going. Sorry, everybody. Okay, I think what I'm gonna do is, can I just go put it into a viewer screen and then they won't see my face? They won't be able to, okay, hold on one second. Sorry, everybody, we're just gonna try this out. Okay, you're gonna meet my husband. Sorry about that, Noreen. He's gonna to try to fix this. Hi, everyone. Okay, we're just going to keep trying. I'm really sorry about that. Thank you for your patience. Okay. Thank you so much for your patience. I really appreciate it. So anyway, one of the things that Noreen said was that, you know, uh, can everybody hear me? Okay, you can see me as well. So 
one of the things that Noreen said was that, you know, I'm part of the Professional Organizers of Canada, and she had never heard of such a thing. And I also hadn't heard about it either. Um, the Professional Organizers of Canada is um, a group of professional organizers um, all over Canada. We also have a similar group in the United States. And we all share a common goal in that we want to create an industry where we are really providing. Because it's been on the chat, but you haven't been reading it. The sound is going in and out and a bit muffled. So perhaps it's your positioning to the microphone. Okay, I can try it a little bit better. I'm really sorry about this. Okay, again, I, 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 I ask for your patience. I'm so sorry. I don't know why the screen isn't. There we go. Join the right. club. It's life. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right. So like I was saying is I belong to the Professional Organizers of Canada. Um, and when I first heard about such a thing, I was like, really? Like, what do you need that? Um, but it's a really great organization. We have all sorts of courses that we take. Uh, we have monthly meetings. During COVID, it was via Zoom. And it's a great way to network and to share information and um, just to get resources from other organizers throughout Canada. So but right now, what we're gonna do is we're gonna talk about how clutter can impact your life, offer you some practical tips um, and how to get you started on your quest for organizing. And of course, one of the things we're gonna always do is everybody always loves a good before and after picture. So we're going to have a whole bunch of those as well. Okay, so one of the things that I'd like to share with people when I'm working with them is, okay, sorry, let me go back a little bit. People always say, oh, you're just going to tell me to just kind of throw out my stuff. Why do I need to have you come to my house and tell me to throw out my stuff? And it's not what I do at all. We talk about your goals. We talk about what's important to you and, um, and how clutter is affecting your life. So... The national, it's very interesting. I had to do a little bit of research. So there's actually something called the National Soap and Detergent Association. It says that um, getting rid of clutter would eliminate 40% of the um, housework in the average home. And the National Association of Professional Organizers says we spend one year of our lives looking for like lost items. Where are my sunglasses? Where are my keys? Where's the hammer? Where's the tape measure? Um, there's also a cost of money. Um, one of my first clients, uh, we were organizing her kitchen and we opened up a cupboard and we found 12 containers of marshmallow fluff. Now, who here has ever eaten marshmallow fluff? Right? Straight out of the, out of the container, right? I won't tell anybody. Um, she also had about 240 ice cream cones. She didn't know what she had, so she kept buying. Uh, another client of mine, and I'm sharing this information with you not to make fun of my clients, just to kind of let you understand a little bit about what I see and what's going on. She had this bottle of called Goo Gone. Does anybody here know what Goo Gone is, right? She had 11 bottles of Goo Gone all over the house. And I said to her, I said, why do you have so many? She said, because I never remember. So whenever I see it, I buy it. So, you know, you buy multiple items because you don't know what you have. Um, a lot of people end up, their paper clutter is all over the place and they end up, they don't, they have to pay late fees because they don't pay their, their bills on time. Um, clutter, it costs you your space. That's really the biggest thing. Um, so they, they, nearly 80% of the items stored in your filing cabinet aren't going to be looked at, aren't going to be read. Um, there are some actual rooms in people's houses that actually don't get used. Um, space is usually at a premium, and when you have too much clutter, you're sharing space with things that don't that you really don't want. It can also impact your health. Um, there's a lot of dust that accumulates when there's a lot of clutter, um, and when you have too much clutter, it usually also can impact on your time management, and then you miss appointments. Um, you forget to where your vitamins are. You forget where your medication is. Um, I've seen this with a lot of a lot of my clients, and so that's one of the things that we also look at is how being organized can improve their health. And the last thing is the relationships. 
Um, I've had a lot of clients who won't have family or friends over because they're embarrassed about their home. Or their children won't invite friends over. Um, we lose self-confidence. We're guilty about our space. And that's not great. So clutter doesn't just impact us physically. There are also other impacts as well. And so I just wanted to share that with you so that you can kind of really, you can talk about how, how we can improve all of the areas of our life. Can everybody hear me okay? Is this all right? Okay, I tend to talk a little fast. So if you want me to slow down, I can slow down. Okay. Now, if I had to share anything with you, this is the most important thing. So many people say, oh, I'm such a terrible person. I'm not organized. I'm so bad. And I say to them, being disorganized doesn't make you a bad person. So many of my clients who are disorganized are the most special people. But so, there's so much more to them than, than being organized or not being organized. It does not define who you are. It's just a tool to make you function better. That's it. So think about it, right? Obviously, as you can all see, I'm not technologically advanced. But it doesn't define who I am. It just means that I either need to learn that skill or get someone to help me. It's the same thing with organizing. If you're not organized, it doesn't define who you are. You just need to learn the skill or get someone to help you. This is really, really important. Okay, so let's go on to the next one. How can the professional organizer help? So I can't see everybody here, but who here, before you heard about the Zoom, even knew about a professional organizer, that there's such a thing? Right. So again, the first time I heard about it, I was like, what? There's such a thing? Why does anybody need a professional organizer? So what I tell people is it's kind of like a personal trainer uh, or like a, like a physiotherapist. You know, if somebody needs to have um, therapy, a physiotherapy or a personal trainer, right? Let's be honest. We can all exercise on, on our own, but we'll push it off. Or as soon as it starts to hurt, we stop. Well, we won't be as efficient. So having a professional organizer will help you with that expertise, help you be more efficient, guide you, motivate you. It's like I once, um, I was in a car accident and I needed to have a, a trainer kind of to help me and she was having me work out and I just wanted to stop because it hurt. I couldn't stop because she was there and I got better quicker. It's the same thing. Having a professional organizer will just provide guidance on how to end that feeling of being overwhelmed. It's like, where do I start? Break down the process into manageable um, pieces. Um, we don't have that emotional attachment to your belongings. Now, it doesn't mean that we're not going to be sensitive to your needs, but sometimes having an objective person makes it a little bit easier. And one of the things I say is, please don't clean up before I come. I need to see your house in all of its glory. Because that's really how I can see how you use things how your space is being, is being used and what we can do about it. So in most situations, it helps to have someone with you because sometimes you get started organizing, you get this burst of, of inspiration, like I'm gonna organize and then kind of stop mid project. Hold on one second. Thank you. All right, so now let's take a look at some before and afters because everybody loves a good before and after. Okay, so this was, um, one of my first clients and she had a room and it's, as you can see here, it is an office. It's also a toy room. Um, it's also, you can't see there was a bed in that room. So this is a room that kind of really had no definition, okay? And this is what we did after. Okay, so now they had a place for their office supplies in this chest that you see the little blue tape is all the art supplies. And now we, they were able to use this in a more functional way. This is doing the Mickey Mouse organizing. Pardon? I couldn't hear you. Okay, let's keep on going. All right, so if you look at the left, um, this was a woman who had a basement. And you know, we talked about the fact that clutter impacts on your use of space. She couldn't use her basement. She couldn't have guests over. We worked together and we created a better, a better space for her. Okay. And this is a bedroom of, one, actually one of my favorite clients. And her kids were coming in from Israel and her grandchildren. 
she said, I need to have a place for them to sleep. So the picture on the left is the bedroom. The picture on the right is how it looked after we were almost done. So really, as you can see, we take, we take a look at the clutter and my clients feel very overwhelmed. And we just kind of figure out how to do it together so that the space is more functional. Now I'm gonna give you some tips. All right, so starting off, now these are really helpful. Uh, so get your pen and paper and write these down. All right, so if, I, mean, I wanted to ask, um, your, uh, Marie, you can unmute somebody. Take, take your pick, um, tell who you want to unmute. Okay, the, the people have to unmute themselves. Uh, Anna Bloom, you want to unmute, unmute yourself? Okay, I'm going to ask you a question. Hi, Anna. Hello. Okay. All right, so let me ask you, if um, you were in your bedroom and you found a fork, what would you do with it? It depends on when I found it. <laughs> if, if I was go, about to go to bed, I'd probably put it on a dresser and take care of it in the morning. Okay, so now it's the morning and you found a fork in your bedroom. What would you do with it? I'd take it into the kitchen and wash it. Okay. Or put it in the dishwasher. Okay, I'm glad you mentioned the washing. And after you washed it, what would you do with it? Put it in the drawer. Where in the drawer? Where all the other forks are. <laughs> exactly. You bring it to the kitchen, into the cutlery drawer into the fork slot. Everybody has a place for their forks. So what I'd like to tell people is treat everything that you own like a fork. Give everything a specific home. And if it's hard to give it a home, I just don't know where to put this. I don't know what to do with this. Maybe it means that you don't really need it. Think about it. Trust me, it's, it's a good one. All right. Then the next, um, the next thing I like to offer to people is the Ohio rule, which means you just take everything that's cluttering your house, you put it into a box and you ship it off to somebody in Ohio. Gonna laugh there. What it means is only handle it once. Okay, so we pick up that fork, that, right? And then we put it down somewhere. And then we pick it up again and we put it someplace else, right? Because we don't have, let's say we didn't have a place for a fork or the mail comes in and we put it on the table and then we have we pick it up and we put it on the desk and then we open it up and we put it back on the table, right? As opposed to picking it up, opening it up, dealing with it and putting it away. Ultimately, we're gonna have to put it away at some point. You think about how many times you physically handle something Right? So your shirt, you take off your shirt, you hang it up, or you put it on the floor. At some point, that shirt's going to end up on the hanger, but now you've handled it so many times. And then, unless it's chocolate or grandchildren, too much of a good thing usually isn't. Um, just like the, well, or jars of marshmallow fluff, who knows, right? But, you know, Many people think, well, if I have one of something, then multiple is also good. If you have enough space, amazing. If you don't, maybe have less. Now, how do you have less? How do you make it easier? I wish we could unmute. Do you think that we could unmute everybody in case like, I could want people to shout out? Would that be okay? Well, everybody would have to unmute themselves and they would have to understand that only one at a time should talk. Okay, let's try it. Let's see what happens. Um, if any questions that anybody has, they can, we can talk about it at the very end. Um, but so, sometimes it's just good to kind of hear things. All right, so decisions. So some of the things that I tell people is ask yourself, have I used this within the past year? Many people are familiar with that, right? So if you've used it within the past year, you keep it, right? So then you ask yourself, does this have sentimental value to me? Well, a lot of things are sentimental. So you can keep it, but maybe you limit it. So when my grandmother passed away, um, there was a couple of things I wanted in the house, and I took a couple of things. I didn't need everything. 
I wanted just those few things that really represented. Got her perfume bottle, and I got her Remy Q Oh wow! That's all Remy Q. There's no way we go down to Florida. That's that's what we do. We say Remy Cube all the time, right? That's all I needed to remember my grandmother. And then the biggest question is, will I need this at some point in the future? So have I used this within the past year? Keep it. Does it have sentimental value? Keep it. Will I need this at some point in the future? Don't keep it. I spent money on it. Or what if I'll need it? You're living in the now right now. You're not, if we held on to things for some vague unknown time in the future when we might need it, we're going to be holding on to a lot of things. Now, if you have the space, then keep it. But if you're struggling with space and you're struggling with clutter, be kind to yourself right now. All right. So, did everybody, were those okay? Was that helpful to everybody? Okay, what do you do? What do you do if it's, if it's not yours, but it's your spouse's? Do you say, Renaline? It's a great question. Can you write that down? Because I do want to answer that. Okay, so write that down and we'll talk about that after. Okay, so when, another thing I'd like to tell people is create a zone. Okay, so just like we may not expect to find our toolbox in the bathroom, right? And we wouldn't expect to find laundry detergent in our refrigerator. <laughs> Every, right? <laughs> Maybe some people who know. Um, every room has a function. So think about what belongs in that room. Your bubble bath belongs in your bathroom. Um, your toolbox belongs maybe in your basement or in your laundry room. Um, so how you think about how is that space currently being used? What belongs there? Who's using that space? When you think of when, remember that first slide that we had that was a toy room and an art room and an office, too much stuff going on in there. To so really think about what the function of that room is, and that will help you to decide what's going to go in. Anna, you had a question? Yeah, my problem is paper. So we, I'm going to give you some tips about paper. Okay. okay. So, but, but I, I'd love to talk to you about it a little bit more. So hold on for there. And um, if I don't answer your questions, we can go back to that. How's that? Okay. okay. So now let's, let's give you some, we're gonna go through some rooms in the house and I can give you some tips on how to handle each room. Okay, so we have the front hall, which I like to call the black hole because you walk into your house, you dump everything and it just, everything ends up there, right? So I like to tell people, you know, in your front hall closet, if, you're, if your front hall closet is big enough to have your winter stuff and your summer stuff, great. No. Right? But if I'm not, gonna, what'd you say? I'm just, Marion, mute. Okay, so one of the things that I tell people is stay in season. So if you have the ability, keep your winter stuff in there in the winter and put your summer stuff away. And then when the seasons come, you flip them if you can, okay? And you wanna use that top shelf really wisely. So many people just kind of throw things on that top shelf. If we get bins and we label them. So one of the things that I'll do is people use someone tell me, oh, I want a bin for gloves and I want a bin for a hat. And I say to them, don't have, a, don't do that. Do it by person. And so this is your dog bin. This is your cat bin. This is your bin. This is whatever bin, you know, you can even have a bin for returns for items that are, are need to leave the house, right? You buy something. What do you do with all that stuff that needs to get returned? Have a bin on the top shelf if you can reach it and label that bin. Because if you label it, it belongs there. I'll tell you a story about labeling. Um, my husband and I went to on a vacation once um, to California. We were in this small little village. We noticed that None of the houses had numbers on them, which was very bizarre. And I said, like, God forbid, but how does the ambulance driver know who to go to? And I couldn't figure it out because everybody labels their houses, your house or your apartment, wherever you're living, it's labeled. The mailman knows 
where to drop off the letter because you've labeled your house with a number. Your mailbox has that label. So the same thing, when we create a bin in your front hall closet, we label it and that anchors it to make sure that you're not going to put the dog leash in with your hat. <laughs> Makes sense. We try, we try. Okay, and then I'm gonna show you some pictures in the next slide about going vertical. So here's one option of going vertical. So you see every, I'm sure most people are familiar with these shoe holders, but they're also really great for sunglasses, sunscreen, uh, umbrellas, um, anything that you need to get you out the door. I actually have one of these in my laundry room. Um, and that's where I keep all of my cleaning supplies because I don't have any cupboards in my laundry room. I have had clients for their kids, they put their Barbies inside these. These are just great, wonderful um, pockets that you can use for anything. But I like to go vertical because I like to be able to use as much space as possible. Um, and then, all right, on the go. So one of the things, and I love this, and I, I, you, most of you probably do this, you make a little note, a little sticky note right by your front door that says keys, purse, wallet, sunglasses, and it's your checklist. Then if you actually have those items in the closet, in a designated area, in a bin or something, it would make it really easy to get out the door fast. Um, now, some people have sliding doors. And one of the problems I find with sliding doors in a, in a front hall is you're constantly opening and closing. I need my coat, it's not there. Okay, let's open up the other one. Okay, it's not there, let's open up the other one. So I try to keep similar items. So these are my winter coats, these are my spring coats, or these are my, my husband's coats, these are my coats. My kids' coats, these are the adult coats, whatever it is just so that you're not constantly going back and forth and back and forth. And then the last part is that no dumping zone. Remember we talked about this, that this is your black hole, right? So it's so easy just, and so you wanna just kind of come in and just drop everything, right? See if you can create a landing spot, whether it's a small bin or a small shelf, where literally everything gets put on there and then you deal with it. All right, let's go on to the next slide. So now we're gonna go into the kitchen. Okay, who here has the most gorgeously organized kitchen? Kitchens get busy. They get used a lot. Oh, you do, Noreen? Sort of. So, you know, people ask me, oh, you guys have the most organized house. And I say, absolutely not, because I have people who live here who thwart me all the time. Um, you know what, but I try my best. So nobody's looking for perfection. Remember what I said before, we're looking just for function, productivity, just so that your house is working for you. So who here has these turkey roasters? It's like this big black oval with white spots. <laughs> yeah, we all have them, right? Okay, I make a turkey once a year for Thanksgiving Sukkot. What am I gonna do with this monstrosity? afterwards right? in the basement exactly put it in the basement do you know how many uh crock pots or turkey roasters or these big monstrosities you find in people's kitchens and they use them once a year but you can't get rid of it because you need it that once a year so if it's really used items put it really high up or put it elsewhere okay um, and then gadgets and gizmos. Everybody loves the cute gadgets, right? You go to Kitchen Stuff Plus and they have all those cute little things in there. You just got to try it. Or the dollar store has all of those things. So um, some things, one of the things that I do is I tell people, get a bin, get a box. Put all your gadgets and gizmos in that box and put it on your counter. Not so pretty, okay? So give yourself 30 days. Every time you use your peeler, Take the peeler out, peel your carrots, put it back in the drawer. Every time you use, who uses a melon baller? Anybody here use a melon baller? But everyone has melon ballers. Everybody has those serrated, multi serrated grapefruit knives. Yes. Right? Well, if you use it, great. Take it out of the box, 
use it, put it back in the drawer. At the end of a month, you might find, hey, there's a lot of stuff here that I don't use. Hmm. Haven't used it. Maybe that could, that, that'll help you to kind of let it go. Okay, now alphabetizing your spices. And when I tell people that I alphabet my spice, I alphabetize my spices, they give me this look like I'm crazy. Now, I don't alphabetize it exactly, okay? But I have two bins. You hear me use the word bins a lot. Bins are really good for containing things. And I have one bin for my A to L spices. Allspice, my basil, my curry, my cumin, my lemon herb spice. That's in that bin. Then I have my M to Z bin, which is, oh my gosh, what do I have there? My Montreal steak spice, steak spice, my nutmeg, my pumpkin spice, uh, my rosemary. Now you know what I cook with. Okay. And so therefore, <laughs> and I actually just write in marker on the top of my spice lid what's inside. Now I know if I'm looking for my garlic, I'm not rummaging, rummaging, rummaging. I know my garlic is going to be in there and I've written it on. It's just a tip. You don't have to do it, but I, it, this is what works for me. Um, an inventory is helpful. Eliminate overbuying so you don't end up with 240 um, ice cream cones. Um, and a cookbook. Who loves their cookbook? Right? Cookbooks are fine. So I found that over the years, I had a lot of cookbooks. I guess people think that that's you know, a great gift to get me. Um, <laughs> and, and I realized I really wasn't using them. Nowadays, I, I do a lot of Googling. Um, and I wasn't really using a cookbook. So what I decided to do was anytime I wanted to get a recipe from a cookbook, I would put a sticky note on that page. And after six months, I went through my cookbooks and I realized there were more than half of them didn't have a sticky note. And I went, okay, if I haven't used these in six months, not my Passover one, because obviously my Pesach ones, I'm only going to use once a year, right? But if I haven't used a cookbook in six months or nine months or 12 months, you pick. Maybe it's okay to let it go. And we'll talk about letting go in a minute, right? Um, and then now, uh, Anna, were you the one who was asking me about papers? Who was asking me about papers, right? So what do you do about papers? So sometimes people will scribble recipes or important numbers on a paper. I like to put those types of things inside my, my, my cupboard. I open up my cupboard door and I actually have a list of the rest of my go-to recipes or important phone numbers, or important schedule. It's right there. I keep looking this way, because that's where I see you, but I realize I should be looking this way, because that's where you see me. I apologize if you're not seeing me properly. Okay, okay. so I have, my house is paper from top to bottom. I have a husband, he's a wonderful man, and he clips articles. Articles. Like, from Every the article. newspaper, and then uh, sometimes he puts them in a, a banker's box just in case he may want to read it later. Um, it, <laughs> it, I told him if he goes first, I'm having a big bonfire. I'll bring the marshmallows and marshmallow fluff, right? Oh, great. Okay. <laughs> because I mean, I would like to just throw it all out. If you've read it once and he uh, underlines and highlights and whatever. Yeah. But, okay. So again, we're going to talk about people who live with you who don't have the same. Yeah. Attachments. <laughs> yes, we definitely will talk about that. All right. Okay. So now we all go to the bathroom together. So I like to tell people, keep it simple. Limit the number of products you use. Think about how, like, so many people have this for this moisturizer. Yeah. I need five types of shampoos. These Let's get rid of all your. Pardon? No, sorry, sorry. That's okay. See if you can limit the number of products that you use, okay? And I'm going to skip the go vertical in a second. Hotel samples, okay. Guilty. Who loves hotel samples? It's okay. Um, I, I, it's just my guilty pleasure. I don't know. Maybe I'm cheap, right? It costs like 10 cents for that little squeeze, but I don't know. I like them and I take them home. Right. Someone wrote in the chat about, uh, giving them to shelters. Uh, yes. my, our, our 
Beth David Women collects them at my home and one other person's home. And I take them either to Via Hafta or I have another source that, that takes them to shelters. Yes. So that's so. what I was going to say. And, and, and I love that. I love it. And we're going to talk about gifting meaningfully because it's so important. So I say use your hotel sample or give them to a homeless shelter. What's also kind of nice is um, I always say I'm going to do this, but I never end up doing it. But in my mind, I'm going to do this someday. Is I'm going to take some Ziploc bags with some um, granola bars, wet wipes, some hotel samples, um, some personal care supplies. And when you see a homeless person, you know the people who are at the, at the uh, intersection, right? Don't give them money. I mean, you can give them money, you can do what you want, but give them something that they can eat. Um, but I love it. And they have to, 100%. And women's shelters, 100%. I love it. Okay, so now we talked about going vertical. Okay, let's see if we can. Hold on, Mark. Sorry, my screen. Oh, there we go. So these are different ways of going vertical. Okay, it's just using the doors to hold on to, to hold on to things for storage. Okay, but sometimes under the sink, it's also another black hole, it's just a big jumble of stuff. This is a really nice way to kind of use your space. Now the closets. I'm gonna give you a before and after of one of the first closets I did. It was so satisfying. Um, so there's a 2080 rule. Okay? So we tend to wear 20% of our clothes 80% of the time. We know what feels good. We know what looks good. We know what's comfortable. That's what we wear. But then what about all the other clothes that we have? You know the ones that almost fit or 20 years ago almost fit? The ones that oh, I, just, I just have to lose 10 pounds and then I'll get back into it. You know, or I spent so much money. I spent so much money. So why would I get rid of it even though I can't wear it anymore? So we all have buyer's guilt. We'll keep clothing we've never worn just because we spent money on it. We'll keep clothes that don't fit us anymore in the hopes that someday we'll get back into them. You know what I call those? I call those guilt clothes. When I walk into my closet, I don't want to feel guilty. I want to walk into the closet and I want to feel good about what I have. Okay, so we make a firm decision to only keep what you love to wear, what makes you feel good. I think we're all old enough to know that ugh, life's too short to have regrets. And I'm not gonna start regretting what's in my closet. I'm gonna love me for who I am. This is what I look like, my body. And I just wanna be able to also make it easy to get dressed in the okay? So how do you decide? Well, did I wear it within the past year, right? Keep it, is it sentimental? keep a couple of things that are sentimental. Will I wear it at some point in the future? Or do you let it go? And how do you know? So what I tell people is, um, and I have a Facebook page and I just I posted this. You see how the hangers here are all facing one way? This picture? Okay. Do that to all your hangers. And when you get dressed, but do them backwards. Right? Or hang a rubber band over the loop. When you get dressed, put on your jacket. At night, you go to put it back on that hanger. You've worn it. You take that rubber band off or turn that hanger right side, right way. After six months, nine months, 12 months, you choose anything that either still has a rubber band on it or the hanger is backwards, shows that you haven't worn it for that amount of time. Maybe. Time to let it go. I like to do things that are objective. The same thing as that bin that we had about the gadgets and gizmos, whatever's left in that bin you haven't used, whatever hanger is still backwards, you really haven't worn that. So I, I have to tell you, I did that once. I'm like, I gotta talk the talk. I have to walk the talk. If I'm gonna tell people to do this, I have to do this. I, have to do this. I had this one skirt, loved this skirt, um, but it just didn't fit me anymore. But it was so pretty. And I said, okay, by my birthday, anything that is still hanging backwards, I'm not gonna wear. Two days before my birthday, and I saw that skirt was backwards, and I'm like, I'm gonna put it on. And I'm like, Erica, 
You're only putting it on so that the hanger is going to be right the right way. It was a reality check. Okay. Another thing I like to recommend to people are narrow hangers. So many people have those big, chunky, clunky, black plastic ones that are curved from like suits. Okay. The thin, narrow velvet ones or the thin, narrow plastic ones are like white or black. It just gives you more space. Now I'm going to show you a great before and after. This was one of my client's closets. Now what you can't see is there was a behind the door opening in was another part of the closet. She actually had not walked into her closet for six months. Uh, sorry. Um, and she actually couldn't even get behind that door. She literally could only wear whatever she could stick her hand in because there was no room. This is what we did. And now if you take a look at the hangers, you see they're all backwards. Right? That way she was gonna be able to decide, figure out what she was gonna wear. I wanted to show you what it looks like to have the hang hangers backwards. All right. All right, Noreen and everybody else is dealing with paper and supplies and electronics. So that, you know, there was a book called Tame the Paper Tiger and paper is a tiger. Um, we are all the generation where we love paper. Right? If it's not if it's not written down, it doesn't exist. Okay. So remember that first room I showed you that was an office and a playroom and a toy room and an art room. This is what the rest of that room looked like. Okay. They had they had no idea. It's still the cables at the bottom and that bottom um, open cupboard. They didn't know what cables they had. They didn't know what papers they had. Now they do. And you'll see that green tape. Green tape where everything is labeled. I now have a fancy schmancy label maker. I don't use green tape anymore, but back then I did. Okay, so how do we deal with paper? So if you're technologically advanced, you can scan your documents, scan your receipts. And God help me cancel those catalogs. My kids, I don't know. They put my name, it must have been a joke, but they put my name on, remember Sears? Who remembers Sears, right? Sears and Lens End and, oh my gosh, you just name it. They put my name on these catalog lists and all of a sudden I have all these catalogs coming into the house. And I said to my kids, where are these coming from? Silence. Well, I quickly contacted these companies and I said, okay, no more catalogs. Um, but, and magazine subscriptions. So many people have magazines that don't even read them, okay? So something to think about. If you have a magazine that's more than a month old, do you still need it? Two months old, think about it. Um, invitations and calendar and, and, and important dates. Remember the Ohio rule, only handle it once? Get the invitation, it's in your hand. Mazel tov, it's exciting. Put the information in your phone or put your information in your calendar, throw it away. You know you have a doctor's appointment, they give you that little card, put it in your calendar, throw it away. And every little piece of paper makes a difference. You want, you have, um, you scribble a, um, a phone number on a piece of paper, don't scribble it on a piece of paper. Put it into your phone or put it into your address book. I actually like to share, share with people that a really good tool is to have a notebook, a designated notebook where you write all your information so you don't end up with all the little bits of paper. So many people say, no, it's not going to work. Try it. Just try it and see what happens. Uh, we talked about using the inside of your cupboards for important information. It takes the paper out of commission. It's up there. It's taped, it's there. Um, and then we talked about creating a designated mail spot, right? So the mail doesn't get put on the, in the front by the front door and then put on the kitchen counter and then put on the desk, put it on the desk, only handle it once. And cables, who has lots of cables? Anybody? Who has lots of cables that they have no idea what they belong to? 
Anybody? Okay. So this is, this, you're gonna have to reward yourself. I don't know if you reward yourself with wine or chocolate or some sort of Netflix binge, but you need to reward yourself after doing this. Please, please, please do. Um, sit down, untangle those messes and throw out what you don't need and label the ones that you do need. So I usually take some green tape and a marker and I write down and I tape it to the label, to, to the wire. And then I know this is the wire to my fan. This is the wire to, I don't know what else I have wires for, um, whatever it is. And then I know what it is. And that's what I do with my clients. We have these big bins and we just kind of go through them and decide how many power bars does a person need, right? Uh, Noreen likes that one. How many, okay, Noreen. <laughs> Uh, how many extension cords does a person need? So we talk about that. Okay, so let's see what we're going to talk about now. So I hope that was helpful. Now, you're all motivated. That's my job. My job is to motivate you, get you excited to do stuff. That's what gets you started. Then, what keeps you going? It's making those habits, right? We all have great intentions. It's January 10th. Y'all had great New Year's resolutions, right? How do you maintain them? It's hard to change habits that have been ingrained for, ingrained for all these years. But if there's another thing that I can share with you that really, I saw this and it changed my life. Nothing changes if nothing changes. And that's with everything in our life, right? If we want to be more sociable, we have to make the effort to go and call people. If we want to be more fit, we have to make an effort to go for walks. If we want to be more organized, we have to make that effort to maintain things. It's not easy. I'm not saying that it's easy, but if you want to have a different life, changes need to be made. And I, I really, I don't want you to say at all to think that I'm trying to be um, judgmental or trying to boss you around. I'm just trying to say, if you want to make those changes, just take those small little steps. You don't have to do all the things that I've shared with you. Take one thing and then try to make that into a habit. And once you've mastered that, we could go look at taking another thing. Next thing you know, teeny tiny baby steps turn into really big life changes. Okay. So one of the things about changing your life I love this one. How to stop impulse buying. So we have great intentions. We're gonna be organized and we're not gonna to deal with clutter. And then you go to Costco and you're like, oh, I need a package of 45 chapsticks all in different flavors, right? Because they're cute. Or I remember had, um, somebody bought my kids. It was a package of 300 multicolored gel pens. I was like, what are we going to do with 300 gel pens? You know, we do, we shared them with other people, right? But you know, you go to Winners and that's such a cute little Hanukkah dish and you go to this store and that's such a cute thing and it's on sale. You know, my daughter and I were once at a store and every, it was like, buy one, get 20% off the next one, get 30% off the next one. And the woman came up to us and said, hey, the more you spend, the more you save. And I said to my daughter, I whispered, the more you spend, the more you spend. Right? So even if it's on sale, you're still spending the money. So how do you stop the impulse buying? Well, create a 30-day list. So you, you and I were walking in Costco and you see me with um, a package of 20 knives, right? And, I, and, and you say, stop, Erica. Write that down. 30 days whether or not you really needed that set of 29. Another thing you can do is you can create an experience fund. How much, how much, what were those, those big packages of 40 uh, different flavored chapsticks? It's $15.99. Great. I'm going to take that money and put it into a fund and really put it into a fund. And then once you've done that a couple of times, take me out for lunch. Or take whoever you want out for lunch. But maybe that experience fund is a lot more pleasurable 
and those teeny tiny impulse purchases that you would have bought. And actually, usually you regret. I was once working with a woman, and I kid you not, she must have had over 50 emery boards. You know the nail files? They were cute. They're the ones that winners, they have flowers on them and they have rainbows on them and they're all different colors. They were cute. And she just said, I can't resist them. But wouldn't it have been better if maybe she hadn't spent all those money on those nail on the nail files and taken that money on an experience and done something with it that would have filled her heart? Um, shop with, you know, shop with the list and stick to it. And, you know, just like we always say, don't go grocery shopping when you're hungry. Don't go shopping when you're bored. Really. All right. So now, how do we maintain it? I've given you all sorts of tips, great ideas, and things that you can do. I'm a little bit more organized. This is the famous one in, one out rule. Buy a new pair of shoes, you get rid of the you get rid of the old pair of shoes. Sometimes that's painful, but then. Maybe you say, then, did I need, do I need to bring it in in the first place? Something to think about. Um, when things are organized, they're just easier to maintain. So we have the one minute rule. Do any task that will take a minute. So I, I'll be honest with you, at night I get tired and I really don't want to hang out my clothes. I'm going to be honest with you, I don't. Sometimes I don't because I'm human. And sometimes I say, you know what? I'm just going to do it and it'll take me a minute. I hang out my clothes. Read, read that letter and throw it in the and, and throw it out, fill in a form to answer an email, to file a paper. Tell my kids, why are you putting that dish into the sink? Just put it straight into the dishwasher. It takes the same amount of time. Otherwise, you're going to put it into the sink, then we're going to take it out and put it into the dishwasher. It's handling it twice, right? If it's going to just take a minute, try it. Okay. And because these tasks are so quick, not hard to follow it, follow the rule, which is one minute. And it has big results. Keeping all those small, nagging little tasks under control makes a difference. And now I want to talk to you about being kind to your future self. I'm going to tell you my lasagna story. So I had little kids and I had made lasagna and I had a pan of like finished lasagna and it was all crusty and burnt and dry and I was getting dry and I just was too tired and I just put it into the sink. My grandmother, my grandmother, the one who like had her perfume and her Remy Cube set, who I loved dearly, who would never tell me what to do, never. This she told me, she said, Erica, wash it. And I said, I'm too tired. Wash it. I'm like, no, I'll do it tomorrow. But guess what happened? Tomorrow was even harder to wash because that lasagna and that tomato sauce and that cheese was so hard and crusted, it took me double the time as if I would have done it the night before. So be kind to your future self. I'll do this tomorrow. Guess what? Your tomorrow self becomes your today self. And it's, you know, so when you say, I'll just leave this for now. I'll do that later. Well, you're being really kind to your current self right now. You have to do it. Right? Your later self becomes your current self. Be kind to your future self. So don't put it down, put it away. And again, habits are hard. Nobody's perfect. Just try. And if you if you succeed a couple of times, that's great. Okay. Now I wanted to tell you another thing that we do as a professional organizer is we help with downsizing. Um, and that happened a lot during COVID. Um, some people decided that this was during COVID, um, they weren't able, their, their family were all out of town and they wanted to move to their family, or they realized that their homes were just too big and they were rattling around in their spaces. Or, you know what, it's just that there are fewer people living in the house and therefore, why are they spending so much money? They want to they live from their lives. So one of the things that we do is we help with downsizing, okay? But it's overwhelming. And there's so many decisions, so much to think about, and it's exhausting. That's where we come in, okay? So we help you decide what to keep, what to sell, what to give away, donate, how to do a paper, 
I deal with those boxes and boxes of pictures and family photos that you have. And one thing I will not do, I will not stand over you and say, keep toss, keep toss, keep toss. Not my job. Yeah, my job is to be more like a personal trainer to help you with making the decisions. So you keep the things that you want, you keep the things that you use, you keep the things that will spark joy. Everybody knows about sparking joy, right? Marie Kondo, well, I'll tell you, I'm gonna get rid of my bathroom scale and my treadmill because they don't spark joy, <laughs> but certain things we need, right? Um, so we'll talk a little bit about selling because some of the things you have, you spent money on, let's see if we can get some money while we're downsizing, okay? And then, giving away. Well, giving is different than donating. And that's why they're on two separate levels. Um, so I'm going to tell you a story about my mother-in-law. Um, so my, my son is turning 30, which is crazy to think. Um, so when I was pregnant with him, um, I were at my mother-in-law's house. Well, my mother-in-law said, I've been saving something from your husband when he was a baby, 25 years earlier. She comes out with this red and black pleather, this fake pleather outfit for a baby. She's like, you have a boy, I want you to put him in this. And I was like, what am I supposed to do? Guess what, I had a boy and I didn't put him in. But <laughs> and I, I promised myself, I said, you know what? I am never, and my mother-in-law had the best of intentions. If anybody of you know my mother-in-law, please don't tell her this story. Um, but she really had the best intentions because she had this for, for her son. So now she wants me to have it for my son. And that's what we do. When we give something that's important to us, we want to give it to other people. Fortunately, other people don't want it. And where they feel guilty, now they have it. And one client, she had this massive fish pot that her great aunt had given her. It was massive. It must've been about two and a half feet long. It didn't fit anywhere. And she's like, I have to keep it because my aunt gave it to me. And I said, but why? Because my aunt gave it to me. So let's talk about if you have to give to a family member, ask them if they want it. And if they don't want it, they're not insulting you. It just means it doesn't meet their needs. Um, and then donating. So you talked about giving to the Ahafta. Um, I love it. I love donating things in a meaningful way. I was working with um, a, a family, so husband and wife. She was a brilliant artist. I actually went online to take a look at her website. Her pictures were so unbelievable. They were inspiring. Um, but she had a neurological disorder and she was actually bedridden. She couldn't paint anymore. And she, they were downsizing and she needed to let go of all of her art, her art supplies. These were professional grade art supplies and the thought of just dropping them off in Value Village just didn't, wasn't gonna do it. Found a girls school, a girls high school that was starting an art media program. And they were looking for donations. And I was able to make a shit up, play matchmaker between these beautiful art supplies on that art school. And that's, and that's what I do. I do that a lot. Um, I had one client that had, uh, they used to own a sticker company and I was able to go and boxes and boxes of stickers and be able to donate it to a children's charity. So very, I'm, I'm very big into High Lifeline. Do you all here know about High Lifeline? Most of you, right? Whenever I find brand new kids toys, they go straight to High Lifeline. Or I had a client that had all these loot bags after their kids party, straight to High Lifeline. So whenever I can, I avoid just doing a value village drop-off. If I can donate something in a meaningful way, it makes me feel good. It makes my clients feel good. Um, and then you deal with paper, which we talked about, helping with the paper. Because sometimes people will say, I'm not selling my home because then I have to deal with all that paper. Um, and photos. So with photos, there's digital scanning. Um, or sometimes what we do is we sort through photos and we actually figure out who's going to get, like this, these family members will get these photos, these friends will get these photos, but you have to ask them if they want them, right? And if they don't want them, accept it, okay? How do I sell? So probably 
many of you have some beautiful china, beautiful figurines, clothing. I'm sure that there's stuff that you have that you'd want to sell. So online sales are usually pretty popular, like uh, Facebook Marketplace, Gigi and Craigslist. Um, I get a lot of sales. I'm helping. I'm able to help my clients sell on that. So the drawbacks of Facebook Marketplace and Gigi and Craigslist is you have strangers coming into your house. And that's not a good feeling sometimes. So sometimes if you have a garage, you know, we can, or, you know, or if you live in a condominium and you have a lobby, you have people meet you outside or in the lobby. Um, confinement stores, I know of a bunch of confinement stores that will sell for you. The bonus of it is that you give it to them, so they deal with it. The drawback is they'll usually take about 50%, but they're dealing with it. And it's the same thing with online auctions and estate. So these are some of the things that, that I do in order to try to help my clients make a little bit of money with the things that they, that they don't need anymore when they're downside. So when you're ready to sell your house, so there's something called staging. Has anybody here ever heard about staging? Right? So I'm going to show you a picture of, of something that, I, that we kind of did. What we do is we do pre-staging. So what stagers will do is they will come to your house and they will make it super pretty so it doesn't look like anybody has ever lived there. And so then when people come into the house, it looks like a museum, right? Um, and it's really very nice, but I think it's a little over the top. I apologize to any real estate agents who are here right now. Um, I think staging is important, but sometimes it gets to be a little bit much because what happens is sometimes you have to get rid of your furniture and they'll rent furniture for you. You need to be able to speak with your real estate agent and be as comfortable as possible with the staging process. So what we do is we do pre-staging. We do all the clearing and we actually try, what, what a lot of real estate agents find is once we've done a lot of the pre-clearing, don't have to do as much as renting of furniture and staging as you think that you might. So take a look on the left. This was the basement of a client who was staging her house for sale. Her husband was a huge collector. If you look in the far back there, those are um, cans of soda, empty cans of soda. Um, on the far left, I don't know if you can see there's like a red picture um, against the wall. He had all of these Coca-Cola paraphernalia, tons of them. And so in this entire basement, and you can't even see what's behind the picture, right? Behind where I'm taking the picture, tons of, of items. Now take a look at that basement. It's empty. So all they needed to do was just room sweep it, move that basketball that's in the back there. Um, and now it looks like an unfinished basement. You see the difference? That's pre-staging. Now, very often, can you imagine if you had to go down to your basement and deal with something like that? That's why people hire us, because it doesn't scare us. Actually, we see basements like this and we get so excited. We always say, we're slightly twisted that way, but these are the things that make us excited. Okay. And then, oops, sorry. How do I go back? Sorry. Cursor to the left, sorry. Okay. So now, once you've decided to move, so many decisions to make. So we coordinate the movers and we order the packing supplies. Please don't buy your supplies from Home Depot. They're very expensive. I have a whole trailer. Um, we pack it all up, help you on the day of the move. Then this is the best part. We unpack it all and we organize it in your new home. And then what about all those boxes and papers and everything? We get rid of it. So all you just need to do is clean take care of it all. So I'm going to show you what this house looked. This is a client of mine. Actually, we just did this about two weeks ago. She was nine months pregnant and um, had an unfortunate situation in her house, and she needed to be in ASAP. This is what her new, we packed her all up. This is what the, how the movers left her kitchen. Can you imagine? Nine months pregnant, like literally about to pop, and now she has this. That's what we did at the end. That's what the house, looks, the kitchen looks like at the end of the day. We created home. Okay. Here's another one. I guess it's mostly kitchens I'm showing you. So this is a client. Um, she, we packed her all up, and then the movers left this for her. And this is what her house looked like 
on Friday afternoon. And she said, how am I going to have sh uh, Shabbat? What am I going to do? Don't worry about it. And this is what the house looked like a half hour before Shabbat was going to start. Okay. And on the left, this is my client's room, uh, daughter's room. And all of her kids' rooms kind of looked like this. And one of the things that we do is we untap and make the room look good so that by the time anybody comes home at the end of the day, they actually have a place to sleep. So I guess that's about it for the um, for what I have to share with you. So you know, I started my my business about nine years ago, and it really is a pleasure. I meet wonderful, wonderful people, and I don't see, like I said, I don't see being disorganized as a moral judgment, or you know, really, it's just a way for me to help people who are feeling overwhelmed. And I have to tell you, it is truly an honor that um, that I feel that people trust me to be able to come into their homes and help them with downsizing, dealing with their homes and their offices. Uh, garages and basements can be kind of scary. Um, sometimes we help them with time management, right? Because sometimes clutter isn't just about an actual physical item, but sometimes it's just having too much to do and not knowing where to, where and when to do things. Um, we help our clients manage their mood packing things up, unpacking. And sometimes, you know, you have uh, an estate that needs to be cleared and you have to try to figure out which family member gets this, which family member gets that. What do you do with all of the stuff that's left, that's left behind? And we help you make those decisions. So together, you know, we clear your space, we clear your mind, and we just kind of make life a little bit better. Okay, so I'm gonna stop my screen sharing right now. There we go. All right, so um, I hope that was helpful. Very oh, interesting. I, I found it fascinating, yeah. Uh, I'm so glad. I'm looking at the chat right now. Um, I'm just laughing right now with Deb said that you had to leave some of your, um, your hotel things at the airport. <laughs> <laughs> I know those. Yes. There's a Jewish woman who'll take food from shuls that's left over and post it and food rescue. Um, there's this wonderful woman. I don't know if anybody knows her. Her name is um, Tia Starr. I don't know if you've heard about her. She yeah. is just kind of- She's very good. Yeah, you know her? I've seen her get, getting and giving. So I had a client. So during COVID, a lot, of, what's your name? Sherry. Sherry, hi, Sherry. Um, beautiful smile. So- mm -hmm. <laughs> I had one, I have a lot of clients that moved like during COVID, they just literally up and left, moved to Florida, Mexico, Costa Rica, and I had to clear their houses for them. And one client from Mexico, she had two storage lockers full of that contents from her house. The movers had just packed everything in there. And I needed to sort through them with her via phone, by like, FaceTime and WhatsApping. Um, and then what were they going to do with all of it? I contacted Sophia Star and she took so much and, and distributed. Again, what we want to do is we want to, we want to distribute things to, to people who really need it and are going to appreciate it because that's what feels good. Um, all right. Is there any, any other questions that anybody has or any comments? If anybody wants to unmute, Maureen, you had some questions about how do you deal with someone who's living in your house um, doesn't have the same feeling of attachment towards things? So I don't, how many people feel that way? Right? Now, sometimes you're the ones who are more attached and sometimes the other person or people living with us are more attached. So Noreen, you're not gonna like what I'm gonna say, but sometimes I'm really sorry. Because um, again, like I said, I'm never going to stand over somebody and say, you need to get rid of something. Um, but what we can do is we can talk about containment and we can talk about respecting boundaries. So if you have your space, they have their space, right? Like my husband, the most wonderful technical person who kind of saved this slideshow, right? So he has a work, he has a work room downstairs in the basement that I don't touch. That's his space. 
right? But if, it's, if things start to infringe onto your space, that's when you can, you can have that discussion. And so sometimes I, I actually, I tell my clients, I'll, let's say I'm working with a woman, I'll say, I'm happy to work with your husband, um, but it has to be separate because you don't want to be a nag. And I have techniques and I have ways. And sometimes I'll have a husband who'll say, could you please work with my wife? And I say, I'm happy to work with your wife, but she has to agree to it. So it's really, there's, there's so much, that there has to be a lot of respect because, you know, there are so many, there, this might be one really big frustrating thing for you, but there might be so many other things about that person which are, are beautiful and beneficial. So it's a struggle, definitely. And we have discussions. Um, Noreen, really, that's what we do. We kind of, I discuss with the husbands, we discuss with the wives, we talk about having respectful faces. You know, I always, there's a, there's a concept in Hebrew, I don't know how well your Hebrew is, it's called um, shalom bayit, right? Peace in the house. And I tell people, everyone should have a shalom bayit closet and a shalom bayit bathroom, right? The husband has his closet, he has his bathroom, she has her closet, she has her bathroom, everybody's happy. Um, Sometimes it doesn't happen. And I'll tell you a quick joke. I once heard a comedian say, he goes, my wife and I, we have Shalom buy it. She sees something, I buy it for her, we have Shalom. <laughs> <laughs> so Noreen, we can talk about it a little bit more if you want. Um, does anybody else have questions? I have a comment. It's actually, there was a show years ago called Neat with a professional organizer and my sister was on it. Okay. She, there was like two blended houses. And she kept saying to my sister, you only need one. You only need one of, of everything. Well, they had about five or six menorahs. She wasn't Jewish. And she says, you don't need all of these. You don't need all of these. And the producer happened to be Jewish. And she said, yes, this is something you don't need just one. You keep them all. And it was just like so funny because like, as you're saying, my sister, she had like three or four bags of flour she had like detergent and stuff. She had so much crap, but until you start pulling everything out, like you're saying, you don't know, but the menorah stayed. That's good. <laughs> and, and you know what? Um, and that's why I really like to work with, I mean, I do have a lot of non-Jewish clients. I, my, my preference is to work within the Jewish community because we're all in the same tribe. Yeah. We get each other. Like we totally get each other, right? Um, I, I remember I was speaking to somebody from out of town and she was telling me that her friend had hired a non-Jewish uh, professional organizer and her friend kept kosher. And the non-Jewish organizer said to her, you just need one meat pot and one milk pot because you can fry in, a, in, in, in one pot and you can make soup in one pot and you can make meatball. Like, and so she, she didn't push back. And I always tell my clients, I don't have the final say. You can always challenge me and push back. She got rid of everything. She had one meat pan and one dairy pan. And I'm like, forget meat and dairy. Even if you don't keep kosher, who has one pan? Yeah. yeah. Right? <laughs> oh, Patrick, I'm so glad that you liked all the great tips. Erica, um, it's Debbie. I'm sorry, no video. Um, just a question about strategy for picture frames. Like I have a lot of family photos and I, I love frames, but I don't have enough wall space or piano space to put all the pictures. So I wondered if you can offer a strategy. Thanks. I've got a digital one. Have you ever seen them? No, I'm a, I'm, I'm dinosaur. I'm a dinosaur. <laughs> so a digital picture frame, it looks like a picture frame, um, but it, it runs the pictures through. So it'll, and you can decide um, how long you want it to be on the screen. It can be, it changes every second, it changes every three seconds, every five seconds, and it runs through your pictures. So you will always, you will always see them. It's, it's hard when you have so many, it, I, I always tell people, try to put things up on the wall and Deb, it sounds like that's what you're doing, right? Um, because you only have a certain amount of, of space to put them down on flat surfaces. So if you run out of flat surfaces and you run out of wall space, and you see the problem with just, like sometimes I tell people, 
you take them out of the frames and put them in an album, you stay in the album, right? Like how many of us have pictures of our grandchildren in our phones, but we never look at them because they're on our phones. But it feels good knowing that they're in there, right? So a digital, Deb, think about it, maybe a digital photo frame that will constantly see the pictures running through. Would that be helpful? Sure. Uh, can I also move in with you? You look like you have some wall space there. I do. <laughs> Good idea. Um, the other quick question is um, about like, I have a kind of an obsession with owls and flamingos. So I don't know where I got that from. I but, love it. Okay. okay. But every time I go into a place and I see there's a flamingo pillow, I'll say I'll, I buy it. But that's crazy because I have all these pillows that I, I can just, I don't know what to do with. So what's the strategy to control? Uh, how to control a collection. So it really is about controlling anything. So one of the things that I do, so I, I love words. If I see a clever, um, oh, I saw these, I went to the one of a kind craft show. You ever go to the one of a kind craft show? They just had one a couple of weeks ago. Oh, I had the best time. I didn't buy a thing. They had these towels and it's the real tea towels and it said, Alexa, do my dishes. Alexa, do my laundry. I took a picture of it and that picture is now um, my status picture on my Facebook page, right? But what I did was I made an album in my phone of all those things that I thought were really cute and very adorable. And you know what? When I was at the show, I wanted to buy it. Now I have it as a picture. But that's not a satisfying Deb, right? It's not. So really, I can say to you, buy as much as you want as long as you have the space for it. And if you don't have the space for it, you do the one in, one out rule. You swap it and say, you know what? I love this flamingo. I, I've had it for 20 years. But there's this new one that's kind of waving its eyelashes at me. I'm going to do a swap. I don't know if that's as helpful for you, Deb. This, something like this is something where you and I would work one-on-one -on -one with and have, have more conversation about. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Okay, one more question from Tina, and then I think we have to wrap it up. Okay. I was just going to say about the digital uh, picture. Um, right. I have a friend who has five of them. She has them in different rooms. So it's she'll have one too. from Listen. a couple of cruises, some from family. And it's interesting, I have one. And I watch it go on and on. And it's memories that you just can't get back. And you never look at your picture albums. Mine right. are in a cupboard. And they can stay there until I decide to throw those out. When I, we moved, we threw out, I don't know how many pictures. I photocopied or scanned them into my computer. Right. They're still in my computer. I've never looked at them since I've moved three years. Yeah. So having the digital frame, it's wonderful because then you do look at those pictures. Yeah. So uh, what I'd like to just share with everybody before we go is um, I'm happy to offer you um, a free consultation at your house if you would like to the members, for people who participated um, in this group. So um, if you wanted to take down my number, I'm happy to give it to you. Um, it's 10 647 741 That's 647-741-5239. And then um, I had it, it was in the, in the slideshow. It had all my information on it. And my email, it, oh, what is that? I, I took a picture of it. Took a picture of it. <laughs> so I emailed you, if you, sorry, Noreen, I'm going to put this on you. If anybody wants to email Noreen, she can pass on my information. Okay, and I, I have all that information and it's being recorded still. So easy enough. Is um, Erica, E-R-I-K-A, at in the clear.ca. It is with a K, not with a C. And I'd be more than happy to come and meet with you, see you in person, kind of give you ideas around your house. And if you'd like to work together, it would be lovely. Well. 
Okay, I want to take this opportunity to thank you, Erica. I'll tell you, I didn't have really high expectations because <laughs> I'm not downsizing. I'm going nowhere. It, it's going to be my children's problem when I'm gone. But that you had a lot of really good suggestions. You're very personable. And uh, it was a joy to listen to you. Oh, I thank you. Thank you. And you know what I tell people is, you know, decluttering isn't always so fun, but I'll make it as fun as it can be. And if okay. I don't make it, if that's, don't that's a good it, promise. <laughs> One you can keep. And I didn't do my job properly. Anyway, I wish you all the best. Noreen, thank you for this opportunity. I loved sharing this with everybody. And I also want to thank everybody who came on and participated and shared their information and shared their thoughts and their questions on the chat or in person. It was great. Thank you. Okay, so Thank good you. night to everybody. And uh, think about clearing your mind and your life. Thank yeah. you. Take care. Okay, good night. Okay. Bye bye.